Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. This is Brie Noble and welcome to the podcast. I am so excited to be here today with Tara Shannon from Willow Sound, Willow Sound Records. And we're going to be talking about a lot of things that relate to you as artists, especially just understanding yourself so you can help other people understand who you are and figure out who you're you know, perfect fans are and how you can attract them. And uh, we'll be getting into some money stuff as we always do on this show. But before, before we do that, I would just love to know, um, Tara, what is, what is your background story? How did you get started in music? I know you're an artist and you've also been helping artists for a long time. So how did you get started in music? What was kind of your music journey and what led you to doing what you do today? Sure. It's so great to be here. First of all, so good to see you. I love everything that you do, especially for women and music. Um, so yeah, typical kid took piano lessons, fell in love with it, studied the Royal Conservatory um, of Music, um, which led me to picking up the saxophone, oddly enough, in high school and became a jazz saxophone player which led me to McGill University in Montreal, where I studied uh, music. Originally, I wanted to go into music therapy. I was really drawn to music as a healing thing. But then I wrote my very first song. I wrote my first song for my cousin's wedding, which now I joke about in my workshops. I'm like, the place to debut a first song may not be at somebody's most important day of their life. <laughs> It's not something I recommend. Now, it was fine. I didn't embarrass myself or my cousin, thankfully. But um, yeah, but through that process, I fell in love with songwriting and just thought, this is what I was born to do. Like, this is what I want to do. I want to sing songs that I've written. And so that on the recording artist path. And so I knew nothing about anything, like most people floating out there that don't know the business. And I was just listening to what people were saying. You need a record deal. You need a record deal. I'm like, okay. So I started chasing this elusive thing called a record deal and, you know, recording music and putting it out there. And by the time I did get that offer of a record deal, I had three young children. And I remember, you know, being explained what would be expected of me and me saying, I can't do any of the things that you want me to do. <laughs> like, I have three young children at home. I can't be on the road for two years because I think one way they said it was it's two years, no family, no friends. Like oh, you're nice. just right all in. And I was just like, oh, I, I don't know. That doesn't sound very glamorous or rock star like <laughs> So that was the moment that I realized that the demands of being a recording artist and a touring artist. Now, remember, this is like before the internet. This is before social media. Like this is 30 some years ago. You know, I, I knew that being a mom was my first calling, if you will, or my, or my first love. And so I focused just on songwriting and just becoming a better songwriter because I could do that from home and writing. So let me ask you real quick. Were they surprised when you turned down the record deal? Uh, I don't know that they were surprised. Maybe. Maybe if I think back to the meeting, yeah, probably surprised, I guess. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about it through their lens. But yeah, I guess most people probably are just like, yeah, to show me where to sign, you know, mm -hmm. but really wanted to understand what I was saying yes to. And it wasn't a fit. Yeah, for sure. Um. So yeah, so I, then I focused on the music that I could do while raising a family. I went on to have four more kids. So I have seven beautiful oh my kids. My goodness, five, wow. Five boys, two girls. <laughs> They're all adults now. But um, so then I learned more about songwriting. And then I kind of carved out a niche for myself, writing songs for organizations and developing fundraising models for them, for their churches, organizations, um, and schools, and which was kind of fun. And I ran a music school at the same time. And then in 2000, in mid 2000s, late 2000s, I actually walked away from music for a little bit because I started a business with my kid's dad and his industry. And we built that, uh, you know, for a good 15 years uh, because that fed the family much better than music did. Mm -hmm. And um, so that's where I really honed my business skills like really got into the nitty gritty of what it takes to build something from the ground up. And then I went back to music in about 2013 
because I had a health crisis. And in that health crisis, I realized I was so unhappy. I was so unhappy because I was, I wasn't doing music. I wasn't, I didn't have music in my life. And I had this grief, this deep grief about it. And so I shifted my thinking of, or my why changed, you know, in my book, I talk about what's your why. And the why was, you know, it went from being on a tour bus and having a number one single to, you know, being helpful to organizations. And now my why was just, I just need to do music because if I don't, I don't feel whole. Mm. My emotional well-being and my mental well-being suffer if I'm not creating music in some way. And so I came back to music with a totally different perspective and then ironically built an entire career around it. Mm. <laughs> as as it happens, you know, when you let go. Yeah, no, I totally do. I had a similar health situation that that had me going all in on music as well. Um, mine was when my kids were little, though. I had a only a two year old at that point. Mm -hmm. But you know, I went through this whole thing where like, oh, I'm a mom now, like, I should just give up this thing. It's ridiculous or whatever. And then yeah. you have a health crisis. And you're like, no, like, if I you know, if I had had died or whatever. Like, I feel like I wouldn't have fulfilled what I was supposed to do in this life. So I completely yeah. get that. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's just woven into the fabric of, you know, who we are. Yep. And so then it becomes about validating spending time and money on it, which is tough to do with music in our culture because we value things that make money. So if we are not making money with your music, are you really successful? Like, are you truly an artist? Are you like all of that kind of creeps in, you know? Yeah, for sure. And we'll definitely talk about that. I, I think what the health crisis does is it crystallizes like what is important to you and yeah. is it necessary to make money? Like if you didn't make another cent doing music, would you still feel like you had to do it? Yeah. And exactly. I think, yeah. What for for those that are, you know, just have that deep ingrained, like, you know, soul thing, then the answer is yes. Like you have to do it. A hundred percent. That's awesome. Um, okay, so I want to go back a little bit and talk about what you were saying about how you started working with organizations, because I think that, you know, this is, I'm always talking about income streams and this is another income stream that artists may have not thought of. Um, it sounds like you stumbled upon it a little bit. Um, I've done a little bit of that myself too, but I never like really pursued pursued um, that kind of income stream. So how did you start doing that with, you know, nonprofits and churches? Did you start with the music and then expanded beyond that? Yeah, it's, I think my, I've always been wired. My brain's always been wired for business or opportunity or solving problems. Mm -hmm. So I think the first one I did was in my own church that I was a part of at the time. Um, we did a little fundraising, uh, you know, concert event because the church needed a new keyboard. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was probably the first official project I did. And then in the recording arts world, opportunities would just come by. I think it just kind of snowballed. Like people would hear about the last one that I did and they would reach out and be like, tell me, you know, how you made the CD and it sold at, at the school to, to raise money for stuff. So the, the, the financial model for the project was either a live show or a concert, you know, to raise, to raise money for a very specific thing or getting a bunch of people. So I did a couple, like I did one for like, um, uh, that comes to mind uh, for a high school in, in Toronto. And it was just a teacher that really loved music and wanted to teach their kids about the recording arts. And so um, I wrote a song, invited them to be part of the recording process in the studio as part of their education. And then the, the CD itself became a fundraiser for their music program to mm. buy more instruments or that kind of thing. So, you know, the financial model was different and unique to each situation. So identifying what the need was and then pulling together all your assets to keep the recording costs low enough that there was actually profits when you sold it. Um, yeah. So it just, it was very organic. You know, it happened um, through the, through the years where it digital, where we didn't have streaming yet. Right. We had people had to buy physical product to listen to music. I don't know how viable that model would be these days with the way that we consume music and how streaming has changed that landscape. Um, but it was, yeah, I was definitely thinking that, although you could still do the live show for sure. Yeah. Um, and that would, and people would support that way, or, you know, maybe people would, you know, you could do like a merch bundle or something where they yeah. got the CD, but like, that wasn't the thing they were really buying. Yeah. You yeah. Know? Gravy. Yeah. But I mean, I think that you know, any income stream is like that where like you stumble upon something or you try something and you're like, oh, this is cool. Like I never would have thought that this could be a thing. And then you kind of go, you know, maybe you pursue a few more opportunities like that or you don't, but then like 
the word gets out and then you become known as that person and people come and they come ask you and, you know, that kind of thing. So I think, you know, we have to strike a balance between like spreading ourselves too thin of trying a lot of different income streams versus like, if we don't try these things, we don't know that that could be our thing. Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, I would definitely start with having a real good idea of your brand identity. Like you have to be really rooted in who are you? What do you have to say? You know, and what's your why? And then from there, in, when you're trying things, at least you're trying things from a place of alignment and clarity first, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as far and income streams too, like you have to also keep in mind that could your income stream, your income can be super high, but when you when you tally the costs mm-hmm. to get that income and not just monetary because time is also right. That's another yeah. currency. So you have to, you have to factor in both currencies, not just money, but also your time to see whether the ROI, the return on investment on that income stream, which you also need to include in there is how much joy it brings you because you have to, you have to assign value to joy. So maybe, you know, maybe, maybe the spread or the profit margin isn't so big, but you feel completely purposeful and full of joy when you're doing it. So there has to be value in that too. So, you know, the trying income streams, absolutely. When you're evaluating the success of it or not, make sure you're evaluating all of the currencies and all of the things you can assign value to. Oh, I love that. I love that perspective. And a lot of times we forget how valuable our time is and we don't, we don't factor that in. And then the joy, that's, that's a thing that really usually gets last on the list. (laughs) <laughs> right. But when I think about it, why have I been doing my women of substance podcast since 2007? You know, it doesn't make me much money. In fact, it makes me zero money, but it like, it reimburses me somewhat for my time um, in that I spend in reviewing music and all that stuff. But I get so much joy out of it. I get great joy out of, you know, lifting up female artists and saying, Hey, you guys need to hear these, this music. It's amazing. That kind of thing. And so I think that's why I still do it even though on paper, it might probably doesn't really make sense, you know, but it is also part of my brand. So that brings up kind of what you said. And then like your why of like, why I do what I do, I want to elevate women in the music industry, that is a huge part of my brand. And so at least for now, that's not going away. Yeah, because it's, you know, it's integral. So you said something um, in in some of the like, prep literature that I read about you that I really like. You said, um, you got to know your why. And then you also have to know why people should care. Right. And I've heard (laughs) that it's like, it's a pithy statement, but it's so true. How do we get across like to other people or make them care about our why? Because, you know, most people, they want to talk about themselves, right? So how can we (laughs) have them see themselves in our why? Yeah. I mean, you say, yeah, because I joke about like, who's going to care? Like that's what I say to my, to my artists. I'm like, who's going to care? Who's going to care about what you're doing? Because Mm -hmm. I mean, fundamentally we can't make anybody feel anything or care about it. I think what we can do is we can really care about it. And that's contagious because that Mm -hmm. will just draw people that are sort of on the same vibe, you know, to it, you know, how do we get them to care about, I don't know that. I wonder, that's a good question. Do we, do we try to get them to care about our why or do we do we lean into what they're really going to care about is their own experience because we're all the same what we care about mostly is how things make us feel Mm -hmm. and you know you know what it's doing for our human experience so I guess what we try to do what I try to do is frame it as you know who's going to care which really translates to you know who's going to make time for this because it's giving them something like Mm -hmm. who are those people that are going to listen to your song and feel what you're about and because that's going to make them feel something that's why they're going to give time to it and that's the that's the basis of trade in in business there's it business is about a trade so you're trading like it's like what's the trade which tells you the value the trade is here's my song i'm giving of myself this is who i am and that's creating an experience and a moment for the the person who's going to care and so the trade is their time for the for the experience of that of feeling something. So the who who's going to care has, I think, a multiple layers to it because you can just use that in straight up marketing, right? When you're thinking about building your audience and, you know, where are you going to spend your ad dollars? How, and how are you going to do up your marketing materials? That's when you think about, okay, who's going to care about this? Because if I make singer songwriter stuff, I'm not going to go advertise first and foremost into the heavy rock world because it just doesn't make sense. They're likely not going to care. Is that to say that there aren't some people who listen to heavy rock that, that won't 
don't like what I do, no, there will be. But you got to start with the core group of who's going to care, most obviously, you know. So the who's going to care thing, I think, is multi, multi layered. And it's about connection. It's really about connection. Who's going to connect to this? And why are they going to connect to this? Are they going to connect to who I am as an artist and my vibe and how I talk and how I dress or the, the vibe of my show? Are they going to connect to the recorded music? Are they going to connect to my social media content? Ideally, all of that should have some alignment, which comes from your branding. Like you were saying, you know, this podcast and stuff is one, one spoke of the mm-hmm. wheel that is you and it all kind of like weaves into each other. So yeah, so that, you know, why are you doing what you're doing and who's going to care? These are fundamental questions that I say to my artists. I don't know. 50 times a day, maybe, (laughs) or my coaching clients. (laughs) Yeah. I'm curious, you know, I'm thinking about singer songwriter music, right? Yeah. I I do think that like the singer songwriters that I've really connected with are people that I've seen live. You know, I've heard their stories that relate to their songs. I've looked in their eyes, like, you know, I've seen them like getting super emotional with their own song. It's hard to reproduce that in a recording, right? I, I feel like every once in a while there's a recording that I'm just like, I connect immediately with right yeah. singer songwriter wise but most of the time it's like I connected with a live performance of that and then I want to remember that so I put it on my playlist and I think it's maybe a little less with things like you know pop or electronic or whatever like I was in the gym today and I'm just thinking like all this music kind of sounds the same but it's perfect for the gym you know um, <laughs> yeah. and so you're not really going to connect with it with an artist that way I don't think I don't really care who those artists are when I'm listening to it in the gym no. um, so I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on on like in this digital world, if you can connect with fans directly online without them seeing you alive or even seeing a live stream of you when you're kind of more in the singer songwriter full, like acoustic kind of genres? Yeah, it's a great question. Yes. I think that connection is possible. We're seeing that. If I look at my own audience as an artist, you know, one of the lessons I learned is to not, is to not assume or make assumptions on what people are going to connect with because I did this silly thing. I, um, during the pandemic, I couldn't, I was playing live streams and doing what we could, like we all would, we all Mm -hmm. were doing, but I started this thing called wind down Wednesday, which was like eight o'clock on Wednesday for a half an hour. I just threw on my Facebook live. I poured a glass of red wine or any wine. And I talked about my thoughts on what was happening in the world. And it was just like this sort of like, not particularly political or anything, but just like chatting about Mm -hmm. my life and what was going on. It was super casual, super chill. It was like, I thought it was the silliest thing, but I was doing it for my own sanity because we were all like in Canada, we were like super locked down. (laughs) The rules were pretty strict. And so, and the irony of the lesson of that was the connection that it created for people and the growth that I saw by doing this consistently was like the data on it far exceeded the videos I was putting out, Mm. the music I was putting out. And so it taught me something about connection. And it taught me that, you know, one of the things that my fans really love Uh, you know, about me or gravitate towards me is, is, you know, just frank, honest, but warm conversation about, you know, things going on or things that I'm going through. And I'm a very open type of person about sharing things that I've learned in my own life and, you know, what I'm going through, the challenges I'm having. And so I learned that connecting with my audience on those issues was just as valuable to them as a song. So I think it's a try, it's a trial and error thing for each artist to figure out their points of connection, because it's, it's a comfort level. Not everybody I work with is comfortable sharing what they're going through with their life. I'm older. I like, so I have the benefit of decades and decades, right. Of life experience. So, uh, versus a 20 year old, maybe, um, you know, so, so I think for each artist, anybody listening, you know, finding your thing of what, what makes you feel connected to people and then lean into that. And that's like, I'm very much a conversation person. I love hearing about people's lives. Like I can't do small talk very well. It doesn't matter where I'm at. Like I, I'll be like, if I'm meeting you for the first time, it's likely I will say, so what's bringing you joy in your life these days? You know, mm-hmm. like I'm that person. So it makes sense that people would feel connected to me on things that I feel connected about. So maybe find the things, you know, that you you, that make you feel connected. So if that's like putting a vinyl record on and listening to it and then like chatting about the experience of the vinyl, so then do that, throw a live stream on and have that conversation with your fans. You know, it's about finding the things that are truly you and not chasing things like trends or going viral and all of that stuff that can make you 
crazy. Oh yeah. I, right? I agree. And I love that. I, I love all of what you just said. And that's very much me too. I'm about to turn 52. <laughs> so after, once this comes out, I will be 52. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like what you said, like, I'm just so over like being freaked out about saying the wrong thing or doing the wrong thing. Or, you know, I just have decades of experience that I can randomly talk about. And yeah, sometimes I'm going to say or do the wrong thing. And I'm, it's going to be a little embarrassing, but I'll get over it because I have plenty of embarrassment that's happened over my life for my <laughs> five decades. You know, <laughs> it's not going to be okay. catastrophic. You know, I see my kid, you know, my kids, one of my daughters, 15, and it's like, oh my God, like the world is ending if this happened to me or whatever, you know? And once you have this experience, it's like, nope, world didn't end. It's all nope. good. Perspective is a powerful thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I love that you, you focus on saying, you know, like you can't know your brand until you really know yourself. So do you even incorporate like aspects of psychology when you're helping musicians? Yeah, I'm a life coach. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, 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 the training and coaching, um, is really, really helps to, um, and I'm really, I'm really big on, uh, like empowerment. Like I'm really big on you are the, you are the authority in your life. You are the expert in your life. My job here in your life is to be a guide and to travel with you while you explain the landscape of your life, you know, like, so it, it's, and then, and then your brand identity and the business planning and the strategy is born from that place, as opposed to, Hey, uh, country music is super trending right now. Have you thought about being mm. a country music artist? Like there's nothing inherently wrong with those business strategies and they can work. I just don't believe they're sustainable. And I think that time has shown us that when you start from that point, the artists themselves that doesn't necessarily bring them joy and purpose, you know, feeling purposeful. So it could work for a time, but it's not sustainable. And then you're starting all over again because rebranding is like starting all over again. So that's why I'm big on your starting point because you're going to put so much time and energy. So trying to capture who you are in this moment and what matters to you is, is super important. Um, so I think by virtue of being a coach, um, that really helps in help in artists, helping artists to align with, you know, who, who are they? Cause I mean, how many times are we ever encouraged to even ask ourselves that like through the school system, you know, we're not, we're not, our culture is not great at uniqueness. Mm. We're really great at assimilate because this is how the system works or the music business is really great at assimilate and be this because we know it sells and we don't like risk. We're risk adverse. So we don't want to take a risk. Right. So we you can't be multi-genre. We need to put you into a box. That's right. Because we have to sell that box and it needs a label on it for people to understand. Like there's some really good business reasons for all that. But the problem is in our industry, the product is a human being. So if you make toothbrushes, the toothbrush doesn't wake up in the morning and ask itself whether it's a toothbrush or whether it still wants to be a toothbrush mm -hmm. or whether it wants to get married or have children or get divorced or tour or not tour list. Like the product we work with is a living, breathing human. It's a, it's a fluid moving, ever evolving thing. And we're trying to take that human and put them into a structure that's designed for inanimate objects. And it's, so you get this tension and, and frustration and disappointment. You know, I, I think part of the reason is that, you know, so for artists that are, are independently and they're in charge and in control of their creative outlets and stuff, the first question is, you know, who, who am I and what do I have to say? And what am I about? And if I was going to make myself a mood board to communicate who I was, what would that mood board look like? Which is one of the exercises I do with my client, which helps them sort of get into the feeling and the emotions of who they are, as opposed to what they think might work. Yeah, that's really good. And I think that, I mean, this is all wrapped up into like the fact that musicians are trying to make money doing this and then they feel like insecure because it's like am I the product am I worth people paying for you mm -hmm. know that kind of thing um so I would love to talk about go back to kind of the trade thing like I really got what you said about like the trade is you know our time and our emotions when we experience the piece of art that the musician created but then what about as far as like them needing to actually make money like how does how can artists get comfortable with that trade yeah that's so tough I mean I'm sure you get the same calls I get so many yep. calls I was asked to play here I don't know what to charge what should I charge mm -hmm. you know and they, there's no like matrix for us to go you know, look at and be like, like in other, in other trades and other, you know, type like, of work. Yeah. Sometimes you wish we had a union, right? So we could just go and like pick a number off of a schedule. Right. And, it, and we, and we do for classical players and right. jazz, right. You know, but singer songwriters not don't fit into that mold so much. 
I, I mean, the first thing that I, I like to do with my clients is kind of figure out what is their relationship with money? Because your own personal relationship with money and your money personality is going to drive how you run your business. So if you grew up in a family of origin that you know never talked about money, you didn't have strategy about money, you don't value money, or money is an expression of your own self worth. So if you don't have a very high self worth, you're gonna start, you're gonna feel uncomfortable about talking about money because it's gonna bump up on that all the time. It's gonna feel uncomfortable charging because you, you're wrestling with, well, do I have any value? And that's connected to you know your belief system. So we kind of try to. What I like to do is kind of untangle some of that to see, you know, what's driving the bus. And so, because it's really, it's easy for me to be like, this is what you should be charging. But if the person doesn't feel good about it, you really, it's going to be more effective to figure out why they don't feel good about that than just imposing this thing on them all the time is this is what you should be doing. Plus they're so, going to come across as super timid and then the people are going to think to themselves, well, does, is this person really worth this amount? Yeah. You know? and there's so many factors that go into it. Like, are you ready to perform live? Mm -hmm. Like, are you ready to do a show? Because a lot of people, they start doing shows and they are not ready to be doing live shows. So there is a, there is an element of cutting your teeth on stage that you do have to like develop through. But I think a lot of people start way too early in the mm -hmm. wrong venues. Mm -hmm. um, so I think like the long, the short answer is it's a balancing act and it's really understanding. It's like thinking about it from a business standpoint and trying to separate from your own self-worth and, and like you said, feeling timid or insecure about it and just trying to look at it practically. Okay, what show am I offering if that's what they're trying to value? What is the venue? What is the typical price point for that venue? How do artists usually uh, set up their shows? Is it is it solo? Is it duos? Is it trios? Like what is the what is that audience connected to that venue expecting? You know, there's so many like there's a checklist of things to look at to be like, okay, what what can I charge that feels right that feels good in this in this situation? So I don't think there's a blanket statement for everything because there's also like coming to your trade point. You know, we were talking about what's the trade. Sometimes you're playing for less money because part of the trade is the opportunity to play that venue or that mm -hmm. festival or open for that bigger artist, which factors in to the value of the trade. It does. It's 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 hard because I hate when people go, oh, you know, you can play for exposure. Oh, yeah, you know. But then on the other hand, you know, I've got this podcast that like. Like they don't get paid to be on it um, because we don't have, we just don't have that kind of budget, but like it is great exposure for them. So, you know, it's, it's like one of those things where it's like, mm, oh, uh, I know. I, think <laughs> I have something to add there that helped me with that because where that was taken advantage of, I think like if somebody like, think about it. Somebody's having an event, they're paying the caterer, they're paying the, mm -hmm. they're renting a space, they're paying for the chairs, paying for this. And then they go to the artist and they go, oh, but we're bringing an artist. Uh, sorry, we're bringing the audience. So it's good exposure for you. So you should, you should play for free. But then the question is, does your event happen without music? Right. If you don't have music, is it the same event? And if the answer is no, then the music goes into the category of renting the venue, renting the caterers, da, 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 da. they don't, they're not doing it for exposure, exposure. So neither is the music. That's where it goes sort of sideways for me is when the service is undervalued, but you can't get away from the fact that exactly like what you said, me being here today, other people being on your podcast, this is exposure, but you would be doing that if your product was coffee or a toothbrush, mm -hmm. you would be that's a nature of business. It's getting yourself, it's getting your product out there. It's getting people to know your name. Um, I, so I think that, cause I used to, I joke with people being from Canada cause it's freezing in Canada in the winter. It's like when somebody says to me, well, it's good exposure. I said, you know what? Exposure can kill you <laughs> <laughs> because up here exposure can kill you, you know? Um, so yeah. So I think it, it, people use it as a blanket thing and it shouldn't be blanket. Like every situation should be broken down because there is an element of value to be in front of certain audiences, but you can't take all the value away of what music, you know, in certain circumstances is bringing to the table. Yeah. I think, I think artists have, they missed that. You know what I mean? Because they have, they know it's their music and like, they know that a lot of times it's their, it's in, it's original music. Right. And so they think, well, does it have value because people don't know this music? Like our covers more about, I feel like sometimes musicians think that in a live situation, covers are more valuable because people know those songs and they might be tapping their toe to them or singing along or whatever. Um, and then they devalue their original music. Of course, it depends on the venue and stuff, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard one to, to value. And then I also see musicians who like forget that all their years of training and practice and schooling and all that stuff, like it has no value. They're just 
counting, you know, I'm going to be here for an hour and a half and therefore I should charge this much. It's like you, you came prepared yeah. for, with 30 years of preparation for this. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And even shorter than that, you know, the hour or two of, of prep work and practice and planning, plus the travel time, plus the tear yep. down and the setup, you know, like there's, you're right. There's value to, to all of that. And the, you know, the original cover conversation comes up a lot for us too. You know, like, you know, if somebody's hiring you as a cover band or to play in a pub, you're providing a music service. You're providing the service of adding music to the ambiance of those patrons experience. That's a different thing than selling a ticket to a show with your name on the ticket. And mm -hmm. you're drawing people to have the experience of discovering new music. So it's a, it's not that either of those has less value or more value, but you're selling a different experience. And so maybe attaching it to the wider view and not just on the songs or the value of the songs. And then within the show, we always incorporate cover music in an original show because the, there is, there's value to the experience of the show. You know, I, when I teach it, when I teach performance coaching, I teach it within the concept of it being a conversation mm -hmm. with an audience. It's a con your show is a conversation with the audience. So if you compare that to regular conversations in our regular conversations, we will always have a touch point of commonality. Mm -hmm. So even in our conversation, right, we're both mother touch point of commonality. You know, we both work in the music business touch point of commonality and a cover song is a touch point of commonality. Mm -hmm. So when they're put in, you're set at the right times, the right places. It's a way to keep the energy and the connection with the audience intact um, throughout, you know, the, the, the design of your set. Yeah. I think that's, it's so important because like, even when we started talking, like when you were like, I had this health crisis, I was like, oh my gosh, I totally had that. You know what I mean? And like, immediately I feel like, oh, I can talk to this person. Yeah. Right. And it's the same kind of thing with, I love the idea of the conversation between, you know, and that's that like breaking down the fourth wall and all that stuff um, that we talk about from being on stage. It, there's so many ways that we can do that and cover songs is one of them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to see if you had any more like business advice. You have so much experience um, being an entrepreneur. What are kind of the the biggest things that you work with musicians on on the business side? Um, I would say understanding that their business is something they run, but it's also who they are because they are the product, their show themselves, their, 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 you know, brand identity. We talk a lot about money, money management and being realistic and that you don't need a hundred percent of your income coming in from your art to be valued and to be a for real artist. If 80% of your income comes from working at Kroger's down the street and 20% comes in from it, and you are still an artist. You're just a really smart artist that doesn't value suffering. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I love it. <laughs> right? Like, like you're running a business. You, you need, you are the business. So in the business of you, the human, these are, this is how much money you need to make to live. Whatever that month, whatever that number is for you at your lifestyle that you like, which is driven by your value system. Then you just break it down. It's math. How are you going to go get enough money to make that? And where I see artists struggling is like, oh yeah, but if I, you know, if I, if I, if I take the job or the, the government job or the nine to five job, then, you know, I'm not being true to my vision and true to my dream. And I'm like, do you like to eat? Yeah. Because that's part of your dream and your vision. You need to be making money. And the reality is in the economics of the music business, even with a fan base, because of the economic structure of streaming being the main way we consume music, you cannot earn a living off your music, mm -hmm. recorded music only. So right. you need multiple spokes. And if one of those spokes is working at the grocery store, so be it. It doesn't mean that you're selling out or you're less of an artist. So we have a lot of that conversation about the value of it and running a, a sound business. So accepting yourself wholly, meeting yourself where you are in this moment, being gentle with yourself, um, learning uh, about the mechanics of this industry, which takes the stress off you because a lot of people come to me, they're stressed out, but it's a lot of the time they have a misunderstanding of how things work, business concepts that they don't know yet. So they're feeling stressed and anxious. So knowledge is power, educating. Um, we do a lot of, you know, emotional and mental health management stuff because that is what's going to drive your business. So for me, it's a holistic approach. It's like, what is keeping you up at night? We got to deal with that because if we don't deal with what's keeping you up at night, you're not going to be effective in, in running your business. Um, so it's, it's, it's a really unique thing, 
when you, the human are the product, uh, because it, it becomes all consuming. So my approach is very, very holistic from a business standpoint and very mathematical and very practical. You know, it's like, this is how much money you have to invest. This is your cash flow. Okay. We got to deal with the real and the reality. Cause I've had people call me and say, somebody, this service, you know, wants me to sign up and it's going to be $1,500 a month for this, you know, this, whatever agency work. I'm like, okay, great. How much income is that going to generate for you? Well, nothing, but it's going to, you know, it's really going to help me. I said, okay, that's great. So do you, is your, does your right now, does your music make more than $1,500 a month? Oh no, my music makes nothing. Okay. So let's break down the math. You're going to spend $1,500 of cash flow to something that's not going to generate any income. And then you still need to come up with more cash to make your music. Yeah. I'm like, okay, so tell me the part that sounds logical <laughs> <laughs> because I've missed the math and the logic on this, you know? And then when you break it down and you say, Okay, if you were uh, a hairdresser instead of making music and somebody came to you and said you needed their service, it was going to be $1,500 a month, you would immediately go, this is how many clients I have, this is what it cost, da, 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 and you would know whether you could afford that or not. Yeah. But in the music business, it's the dangling carrot syndrome. It's mm -hmm. like, what if? what if this is my big break? And what if this is my opportunity? And what if I say no to this? And blah, blah, blah. I guarantee you, if you choose not to spend that money on whatever agency, it's not going to close you know, the door on your on your big break because it should be a mutual trade. So just practical mm -hmm. things. I'm super practical. I'm like, let's get the emotion out of this and just break it down logically. I'm glad you said that because so many artists deal with that dangling carrot thing. Oh, and, yeah. and, and, you know, whoever they are, playlists, pluggers, you know, uh, agencies, whatever, they know how to play upon those emotions. They do. They do. Ugh, and know. you know, what's so frustrating is there's nobody inherently evil in the system. Everybody is just trying to make a living and they see a possibility to sell this service. And there's nothing inherently wrong with selling a service that you believe in and you think mm -hmm. you can deliver. But because artists are conditioned by the messaging that you need to slug it out until somebody with power discovers you, plucks you from the masses, and deems you specialer than everybody else, and they're going to elevate you to stardom, we are primed to be waiting constantly for that moment to happen. And that messaging is reinforced. The voice, the launch, the shot, the one, the song, like all of this messaging of, you know, this, this you're going to be discovered by somebody with power. So of course, everybody's sitting there waiting for somebody to come by and say, I can make this happen for you. Mm -hmm. You know, we're primed for that moment. So for me, it's about switching that framework and, and taking your power back and being like, wait a minute, I'm going to look at this like I'm running a business. If I was running a coffee business, I wouldn't be making coffee for my family and friends and waiting for Starbucks to discover me because that <laughs> no sense, right? But essentially that's what artists are doing, waiting for Starbucks to discover them while they pour coffee for free for their friends and family, you know? So it's about changing the, the narrative. What's the business? How do you build the business? And does that service make sense? for your business in this moment in time. And if it does, great, but it will be clear to you. It will make sense and it won't feel like this dangling carrot, all this emotional stuff tied up into it. The what if this is my big break? Like there's no, we don't think like that in business. That's not a thing. <laughs> that is so true. It's like, here's my advertising budget and you know, That's and can, and can yeah. I afford to do that? And, and I love, I love what you said about, you know, if you had to go work a part-time job or whatever, it doesn't make it any, you any less of an artist or it any less of a business. And I think about that you know, with myself, like I used to do this full time. And at some point after the pandemic, I was just like, I need to do more music. I need to sing more. I need to get in front of people, all that. And I took a job as a worship director at my church and then expanded into even more time. But that doesn't make this any less of a business because I'm doing that. In fact, I think it makes it better because I'm fulfilling a part of me that was missing. And so, you know, for artists, like maybe, you know, the part of you that's missing is not, I need to go work at a, you know, as a barista or whatever, but maybe you need the social contact and you need money, right? So it works. It's, it's a good combo yeah. for you. And there's no shade if you want to go wait tables or be a barista or work at a grocery store or work in an office, you know, a business office like I do. Um, it's it's using different parts of your brain, different parts of your talents um, that maybe aren't being satisfied by being an artist. And there's nothing wrong with that. No, there really isn't. It's actually very smart because, it, you know, the you know, one of the things I cover in my book is like the uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm. Your physiological needs need to be met first. That's shelter, food, water, breathing, right? The basics. So if you if you are stressed, 
about any of those things. You cannot get to the creative. It's not possible. Your mm. brain is hijacked by physiological. And that's like conceptually in your whole life, but also in a moment, if you're super hungry right now and you sit down to try to co-write with somebody and oh, you're God. hungry, you can't write. You got to go eat a sandwich and then you can write. Physiological needs first. So, you know, accepting that and, and being gentle with yourself and being like, yeah, this is just like, I need to pay my rent. I need to eat. And my own music matters to me. And it's not going to generate enough income for me to do this. And I don't want to be suffering and distracted. So I'm going to do what I need to do to make good decisions and lower the stress around that. So my music will be better and I'll have money to make the music that I want to make. Right. So it's just changing the narrative, changing the framework. I love that you approach that from the, the Maslow's hierarchy, because that's true. Like, and about the creative side, it's true. You can't create when you're distracted by hunger. No. You know, there's lots of things I can't do when I'm really hungry. Cause I just can't focus. Um, <laughs> and, and I always approached it from like the money side of like, if you are thinking if I don't get this gig, I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. You're not going to approach that in a way that's going to make someone want to hire you. That desperation is going to be visible or palpable, and that's not going to help you get the gig. No, it's going to just going to change the way you do trade. Yep. It's going to affect your ability to trade, you know, in a, in a calm and in a practical and a, a business-like manner. Yeah. I love that. Well, you mentioned your book. Could you let our listeners and the people that are watching know how they can find your book? Oh, sure. It's called You and the Music Business. Um, a self, <laughs> what is the name of my book? A self-care guide to uh, empowerment and finding more a joy in today's music industry. And so you can find it on all Amazons and you can also go to tarashannonmusic.com and you can get it there if you'd like. Um, yes. And pretty soon, I, I think like in the eminent weeks, it will be global as well. So chapter Indigo, you know, those regular, all Got the it. places you find books. So yeah, it's called You and the Music. Awesome. And how can they connect with you online? Uh, uh, on socials, it's at work with Tara Shannon. Um, they can go to my site, booktara.co. And they can, um, they can also visit um, www.gro-ve.com. And that's the grow. And that's where I do my coaching, life coaching for artists, strategic planning. So you can just sign up for a session right there. Yeah. But on socials, you can also message me, work with Tara Shannon on Instagram and Facebook and LinkedIn. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tara. This has been such a con fun conversation. I didn't know before we started that we had so much in common and so many of the same ideas and, you know, philosophies about helping musicians. So it's been a super fun conversation. Thank you so much for sharing with everybody today. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for all the work that you do and continuing to send you creative energy to keep it going so that you can keep lifting women up, which is awesome. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at rondifay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.